right, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to wish everyone a happy Archaeology Month. Thank you for joining us tonight for our very special living room lecture. We have new insights from the Nathan Harrison Historical Archaeology Project by Seth Malios. My name is Stephanie Sandoval, and I'm the Deputy Director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. Um, to find more about the center, uh, please visit us in person. We are open to the public or visit our website at sandiegoarchaeology.org. Our next online lecture is by Arlene Rosen out of the University of Texas, Austin. She is going to be speaking on the origins of wheat agriculture in the Eastern Mediterranean, and that talk is November 18th. Registration will open soon, and you can find details for that talk on our website. For those who are expecting Dr. Malios's book, Born a Slave, Died a Pioneer, Nathan Harrison and the Historical Archaeology of Legend, you should be receiving those any day now. Um, and if after tonight's lecture, you decide that you would like to purchase a copy, please send me an email and we can make arrangements for you to pick it up at the center or I can drop it in the mail for you. Um, tonight, we will be using the Q&A feature like always. You can find that on your Zoom control panel. Feel free to enter questions throughout the entire um, entirety of the talk, and then we will have a moderated Q&A at the end. Um, I'm very happy to have Dr. Seth Malios with us tonight. He is a professor of anthropology, the university history curator, and the director of the South Coastal Information Center at San Diego State University. Dr. Malios previously served as site supervisor at the 1607 James Fort archeological site in Jamestown, Virginia, the first permanent English settlement in the Americas. Since moving to San Diego in 2001, Professor Malios has spearheaded six local research projects, including the Nathan Harrison site on Palomar Mountain, which, is he, which he is talking with us um, tonight. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Malios. Thank you and welcome. Thanks so much, Stephanie. And thanks to all of you who are joining us tonight. It's funny to give a, a talk called New Insights from the project because what I wanna to do tonight is fill you in on both old insights and new insights, but the real moral of this story comes in the fact that we had been digging at the site for quite a while and we had been working on this project for quite a while and leading into this past summer, leading into the summer of 2021, I didn't think we were going to find that much that would change how we thought about the site. And so the moral of this story is, is how wrong I was. That's that would be a better talk for a better title for this talk is how wrong Seth was, because we had a summer that just blew me away in terms of not only what we found, but how those things could impact our primary interpretations of the site. Um, you'll hear me use the words we and our quite a lot in this talk tonight. Um, I'm not, it's, it's not any sort of uh, humility on my, on my part. Uh, it's the fact that it is a team effort. We've had over a hundred students dig with us. Uh, our team in terms of associated researchers, uh, volunteers and different collaborators is probably over a thousand. And I'm deeply indebted to everybody who has helped out with this project. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, before I came to San Diego, over 20 years ago now, I was site supervisor at Jamestown. And so on the side of the picture there, on my right, you can see a far younger Seth Malios digging there at Jamestown. And the first time I ever talked about Nathan Harrison was during my job interview at San Diego State. It was in 2001. It was 20 years ago. And, and that's when I first talked about how exciting it would be to investigate Nathan Harrison for so many reasons, because he was a, a key part of the multi-ethnic history of San Diego, because it was a story that had so many mistruths, so many myths that were tied to it. And also because this was, uh, there was an excitement about whether or not we'd even be able to find this site. So today I'm gonna to take you on a ride, both through what we've done in the past and then we're going to focus very intensely on this past summer and the things that we found. So starting with some of the old insights, the reason that I love researching Nathan Harrison, the reason that I found this idea to be so compelling is I don't think it's just a good African-American story. I don't think it's just the quintessential African-American story in terms of overcoming obstacles. I think it's the quintessential American story. 
if you ask yourself what it means to be an American, how we define ourselves, so much of that is tied to perseverance. So much of that is making something from nothing. So much of that is overcoming hardship. And that's where Nathan Harrison's story pulls me in and I think pulls so many of us in. This is an individual who was born into slavery in Kentucky in the 1830s. And most people in his situation, African-American males born into slavery before the Civil War, their average lifespan would be 30 years. And he lived to be almost 90. So in terms of his longevity, he, he was able to overcome so much, whether it was being enslaved, whether it was traveling cross country, whether it was the gold rush, surviving the, the mania of the gold rush, whether it was enduring the Wild West, all of these things he managed to overcome and then become a valued community member, being the first permanent African-American, the first African-American homesteader in San Diego County. And, and so that was a huge part of it. But then this, this project gets so fascinating because it's not only about Harrison, it's about how people used his story, whether for good or for bad, whether they had an agenda to make him look like a hero or had an agenda to undermine him. We saw Harrison's story take on a life after Harrison had passed. And this notion of, of evaluating myth-making and asking ourselves, why do we tell certain stories and forget others? What is it that's gripping about a narrative that pulls us in? That's something, I mean, that goes to the human condition. Um, and that's where suddenly this investigation of Harrison gets so much bigger. And then the third thing in terms of the old insights was the big surprise of the project. And that was through the archeology, span we were able to uncover a secret double life of Harrison. Many people examined the narratives of Nathan Harrison before we came along. And no one ever suggested that he had this dual identity, this secret double life. And for me, it's exciting because it's one of the victories of archeology. span Without archeology, span we wouldn't have been able to figure this out. And it's, it gets me excited, not only as an archeologist, but as someone who's very skeptical of the written word. As someone who every time I, I read something that's written, I think to myself, what was the author intending for their audience? I think about bias, I think about perspective. Whereas when somebody throws their garbage out, I don't think they're considering that folks like me and folks like you would be interested in going through their garbage and getting their life story that way. So those were the three key things in terms of pulling us into the Harrison story for a project that started in 2001 and digging that started in 2004. I'm very proud with what our team has accomplished, uh, not only coming out with a, a major exhibit that's now at the San Diego History Center, um, and a full length book on the project. Um, we also made the, the cover of Archaeology Magazine, something I absolutely love. If you look closely over the header, it says, a journey from slavery to pioneer legend in the March, April, 2021 edition. And we had a, a full uh, journal volume come out on Nathan Harrison. Uh, it's, it's something I take great pride in, especially when you consider that we had all these plans for 2020 because that was the 100 year anniversary of Harrison's passing and then COVID hit and we had to completely change everything we were trying to do. Our initial exhibits at the History Center were geared towards being hands-on and squeezing as many people in there as possible. And then suddenly we had to say to ourselves, all right, now, to do now design an exhibit where no one touches anything and no one's ever closer than six feet to one another. Um, and so it, it's something that is, is very rewarding to, to see the things that, that we've been able to accomplish. And for any of you who haven't been down to Balboa Park's History Center, I hope you check it out because that's the only place you'll see the complete Harrison cabin. Uh, you know, it's a reconstruction, but at the same time, it's pretty breathtaking to see the roof on the cabin and to see the, the full structure that's there. So when we talk about the, the Harrison bi biography, uh, many of you have heard me talk before, and you know that I'm captivated by this story of overcoming obstacles. Um, this is a, a biography of adversity, and it's why I think it's a biography that, that everybody should know when they study U.S. history. Um, one of the, 
one of the things that frustrates me the most is there's this one quote about San Diego history, a very prominent historian said that nothing important happened in San Diego before World War II. And that's always just driven me crazy. I feel that people can learn about American slavery. I feel that people can learn about the gold rush. I feel that people can learn about these important lessons in American history through studying San Diego history. We're not an afterthought, we're not a footnote, but these stories of overcoming adversity, these stories of perseverance, that they are something that people all over should be engaging in. One of the, the gripping aspects of the, the Harrison narrative is how he embodies the romanticized American dream. Uh, whether you define it in Jeffersonian terms of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or you look at John Locke, who Jefferson borrowed from hev heavily, life, liberty, and property ownership, Harrison accomplished all of those. He led this long life. In fact, there are accounts that he lived all the way to 107 years old. Uh, that's highly unlikely. It's more likely that he died in his late 80s, but that still is a remarkable lifespan. In terms of liberty, this was an individual who was born in a situation where he had no liberty. And we're going to talk about this a lot today. Just because he was in California did not make him free. That's one of the biggest no misnomers in teaching California history is this ideal that California was a free state. Because Harrison was brought to California as an enslaved individual. Before California entered the Union as a state, he stayed enslaved. He and thousands of others, uh, thousands of other African Americans in the 1850s were still enslaved in California. And, and furthermore, we, we need to be honest about California history. When, when California was admitted as a so called uh, free state, they also enacted the most severe fugitive slave laws. Uh, that was the compromise with California. And so suddenly you had all sorts of penalties and people being removed and being sent back to slave states, even if they had obtained their freedom legally. Um, so this, this issue of liberty is, is paramount. And Harrison not only had his liberty, but that was part of his story, living up on Palomar separate from everybody at a spot where he could see people coming for hours in advance. Uh, he may have lived in the most free spot in all of San Diego County. It's the highest spot in the county. And in terms of his ability to then choose with whom to engage with, that is a measure of, of liberty and freedom as well. When it comes to defining happiness archaeologically, it's something that I've always thought is an impossibility. And, and maybe it is. But there are a few ways to look at happiness. One is being part of a community and acceptance. And it's clear that Harrison achieved that. And there's so many different measures of that. Part is the fact that so many different communities claimed him. Part of the fact is at one point in 1911, he lost his property uh, for not paying his taxes. And the local community rallies and gets his property back for him. And so this is an individual who, who definitely was beloved and checks that box of, of happiness. But perhaps I'm, I'm going too deep into trying to figure out happiness. Um, you know, there are individuals like Harriet Tubman that said, look, you know, liberty is happiness. It starts and ends right with that. Um, and then to the John Locke definition of life, liberty, and property ownership, Harrison was the first African-American homestead. He homesteaded land at, at Rincon down at the bottom of the mountain making him the first African-American homesteader, even before he then homesteaded the property that, that we dug, that's two thirds of the way up the west side of Palomar Mountain. One of the, the most entertaining parts of the Harrison story is reading all the different accounts. There are over a hundred different accounts of Harrison and boy, do they contradict each other and boy, do they pull you in different directions. And if you, take one too literally, you find yourself at odds with so many others. But if you read these stories in a different way, if you read them as a celebration of the Wild West, of all things Old West, if you read them as just an American narrative, then you realize that Harrison is being placed at every major Southern California event in history. And if you, you look on the right side of the page here, you can see so many different things um, in terms of these famous moments, you know, in terms of being part of the Mormon battalion that did the largest 
uh, or the longest march in American history. There's stories that place Harrison with them. How about fighting with Fremont's battalion in the Spanish-American War? Certain accounts had him there. What's funny is how did he get to California? Well, some people claim that he sailed around uh, Cape Horn, the tip of South America to get there. Others had him escaping slavery um, by floating down a homemade raft, just like, um, just like the Huck Finn. And so you, you have Harrison being placed in all these, in all these amazing events. And the, the colossal storm in San Diego, the great San Diego flood of 1883, the local newspaper reports that he drowned in that storm. And of course he didn't. And so we see him showing up. And, and this is where I like to say he's, he's the Forrest Gump of Southern California history and that he's always in the background of these events. Once we get past the effort of being able to disprove so many of these stories, and it's, it's fairly straightforward to do, then we have to ask ourselves, why? Why was he placed in all these stories? Why do we love to tell the story that Harrison was hanging out with the, the most notorious bandit of the Wild West, Joaquin Murrieta. You know, what, what pulls us in? What is so gripping about those tales? And that's where this gets fascinating. When we start thinking about different aspects of a myth that gets celebrated, when somebody becomes larger than life and where we hold on to their myth and let go of their reality, when that becomes so important to us. Now, one of the things that I like to do is, is turn archaeological methods on their heads. Uh, when I was out on the East Coast, I was very privileged to work with um, some very influential historical archaeologists. Uh, Jim Dietz was my advisor, and I, I owe him quite a, a debt. At the same time, I got to work with Noel Hume and Bill Kelso. And Noel Hume is such a, a charismatic individual, such an opinionated individual and was a, a true inspiration in terms of how he always challenged me. He always believed that archaeology, and these are his words, archaeology was a handmaiden to history, that history was really in charge, um, and that it was, you know, archaeology just came in and confirmed what we already knew. Uh, he used to say that, that the historical archaeology was an expensive way of finding out what you already know. And, and I, always, I always had a chip on my shoulder about that to try and prove that wrong. And so Noel was always privileging the history and historical archaeology. And so I deliberately decided to develop something I call archaeological history. And that is taking a, an archaeological technique, seriation, looking at things in series. You know, archaeologists created the word seriation. It wasn't a word before uh, archaeologists started, started using it. And I like to look at history like it's an artifact look at stories in succession. And that's where we got to see the stories of Nathan Harrison change over time after his passing. That's the key thing to keep in perspective here is that these stories change, not because Harrison was changing them, he had passed away by this point, but people knew who knew him or people who had only heard of him started rewriting history. And, and some of the changes are subtle and don't seem to pack that big of a punch. Like if we, if we look at how his home structure was described over the years and how that changed over time, we see it changed in a fairly linear manner from being a shack to a hut, to a crude cabin, to a house, to a cabin, those X's going diagonally from top left to bottom right. We also see people describe him as being smarter and smarter over time. And they also describe him drinking have more and more heavily over time. People called him a teetotaler in the 19 teens. And yet when you get to these stories in the 1990s, we have an entirely different portrait. So that's the subtle gradual changes that we see and we're able to chart them out. At the same time, some of the changes could not be less subtle. Some of them are blatant. And that's where we get to the grand fiction or what I like to call the big lie of Senator James B. Utt. James B. Yet uh, was a local politician who ran for office in the 1960s, and he and his people changed the Harrison narrative holistically. So for decades, the established story of Harrison was that he was owned by a man named Mr. Harrison, which was very common in the antebellum South, that slaves and enslaved individuals took the last name of their owner. 
So he was owned by Mr. Harrison, brought to Northern California, and then Mr. Harrison passes away and Nathan Harrison migrates southward. Um, Harrison was, was from Kentucky. We have it in the census records. Every five and 10 years, we're able to track them across the country. So this was the established narrative. However, in 1960, everything changes. In 1955, in fact, is when it changes because that's when James Biet first runs for Congress. And when he announces his candidacy, he takes out a half page ad celebrating his candidacy. And on the other half page of the magazine is the new story of Nathan Harrison. And in this new story of Nathan Harrison, Harrison was owned by James B. Utt's grandfather. And suddenly we have a totally different narrative. Suddenly Harrison isn't from Kentucky. He's from Virginia. Suddenly they don't go to Northern California. They come straight to Southern California. Suddenly the narrative changes and you know what? It's all a fabrication. And it's a fabrication because James Biot wants to take this story as his own. He is not sympathetic to African-Americans. He is not sympathetic to Nathan Harrison. James Biot is an individual. He served six consecutive terms in Congress, votes against every civil rights bill that ever came up and started spreading propaganda that there was, quote, a large contingent of barefooted Africans that were that came over through Cuba and were now training in Georgia to take over the US. This is one of the original fear mongers. He spreads this extremist propaganda. He uses the Harrison story in a way that is unethical and incorrect, but it takes. When I came to San Diego in 2001, this was the dominant narrative. If you went to the different web pages about Harrison, the different articles about Harrison, what they all stated was Harrison was from Virginia and had been brought across by the Utt family, which was totally wrong. He got away with it. And this is where archaeology is so dear to me, because sometimes I feel like we're the last line of defense for getting at the truth, getting at the reality of the matter. You can't talk about Harrison without acknowledging the fact that he's likely the most photographed late 19th century San Diegan. And we gotta, we gotta put this in context. You know, Nobody had cell phones. Nobody was in that position where their phone was always on them. People who took a picture of Harrison and it was always on Palomar Mountain, they did it deliberately. They, know, they, did it, they, they, they knew they were gonna come visit him. Uh, it was all something that was choreographed well in advance. Uh, we now have over 30 different photographs of Harrison, more than wider, more than any of, of our, our favorite old-timey San Diegans, Alonzo Horton, you name it. But what's interesting about these photos is how consistent they are. Uh, linguists and anthropologists often talk about a grammar, uh, a set of rules that governs languages. Well, grammars can also be extended to things outside of language. These photos had a grammar in terms of what they showed Harrison doing and also what they never showed. And what we see here is that he was always depicted hard at work on the mountain. Um, he wasn't photographed armed. He wasn't photographed in an aggressive manner. He was always leaning on his cane. He was always depicted as very non-threatening. And then we get some of the oral histories that emphasize that whenever Harrison heard people coming up the mountain, he would go run and put on his worst clothes, his most tattered clothing, because that was part of, of his shtick. You know, some of us, when people are coming over, we immediately clean the house cleaner than it's ever been and put on our nicest clothes. Harrison did just the opposite. And what's so interesting is when you look at the other old timey photographs, every other Palmar Mes Palomar Mountain resident was photographed with his or her firearm. And we see so many pictures of other Palomar individuals on their horses. Harrison was never photographed in this empowered way. Even though he raised horses, we never see a picture of him on a horse. Even though he had firearms, we don't see a picture of him with them. And this is a very important point about the image that he wanted to send out to the world. He was an active participant in storytelling. He was an active participant in these photographs. His close friends were photographers in the nearby mountain community, Robert Asher uh, and other individuals. He knew what he was doing. This was all very deliberate. So let's get to the, 
to the previous uh, eight years of archaeology. We dug from 2004 to 2008, and then we took a break between the devastation of the Pumacha fire, a change in land ownership. We took a break until 2017, and then we started up again with annual summer field schools. When we first got to the site, we couldn't see anything. The weeds were waist high. There were rattlers all over the place, scorpions. It was rather inhospitable. And I had competing fears that we either wouldn't find anything or we would find millions of artifacts and I didn't have enough lab space for them. Fortunately, the teams found just the right number of artifacts. And over time, we were able to expose a perfect 11 foot square cabin. And when I say it's perfect, it's because it wasn't a rhombus. Diagonal was 15.5 feet. It was very carefully laid out. It was made out of the local cobbles. Uh, they weren't mortared together. Um, they just used dirt as chinking to hold it together. There are four corner posts. It has cedar shake roof, but it was entirely buried when we found it. And we also found a sunken dirt floor, which is fascinating because that's part of the indigenous uh, in terms of their building tradition. The sunken floor keeps it cooler in the summer and warmer in the, in the winter. Over the years, we found 55,000 artifacts. And, and this is where I get so excited about archeology span because every single one of them dates between 1865 and 1918. It has such a tight date range from our terminus postquem to our terminus antiquem. We are able to come up with this very tight date range. And it tells us so much about daily life and what's neat is, is when you compare it with the other sites that have been dug in the region. Uh, remember, we want to be doing archaeology here. We want it to be a comparative study, not just a, a singular site study, not just an archaeography, but an archaeology. And that's where we see it fits into Steve Van Wormer's patterns for the local area with one caveat. It, it looks like a, a rural site, except it has so many different alcohol bottoms, except it also has some high status prestige goods. And that's where we see the intersection of Harrison's life as a rancher and his life as the first tourism destination for San Diego. It's so fun to examine it because San Diego is now such a, a tourism spot, a tourism mecca. Well, Harrison was one of the first tourism spots for San Diego. And, and it was part of something that they made into a system. It was a, a three-day ride to get from San Diego to Escondido, Escondido to Tin Can Flats, Tin Can Flats up the mountain. And Harrison was a stop as they made their way up to the lodge on top of Palomar Mountain. Um, and it was, it was very deliberate. Whether these were horse-drawn wagons and Harrison Spring would be water to feed the horses, or whether he brought his water to help the early Model T radiators that were bone dry as they made their way up the, up the road. So through the years, um, we found no outliers. Uh, we found a very consistent pattern. There's some intriguing things in terms of the, the cabin itself didn't have very many artifacts, but the patio did. Very, very similar to different slave quarters across the South that I've dug. That, that's, that's part of the African tradition is that the main activity is the patio not the cabin itself. In fact, the patio is an Africanism. It's something that was brought over by West Africans uh, when they were brought to the, the American South. Um, and, so, and so we see this, this blend of life at the site. And, and this is where I always wanna make sure that we both tell great stories about individual artifacts, but that we also don't miss the, the trees for the forest or the forest for the trees going back and forth. Sometimes we look at entire artifact patterns and then sometimes we look at individually spectacular artifacts. So the, the story, the, the dominant interpretation Harrison uh, of Harrison through the photos and through the historical narratives was that he was beloved by all, that, that he was you know, the, the hermit on top of the mountain, but it also depicted him as a fool. It depicted him as someone who didn't speak well, someone who didn't have a whole lot of knowledge, and that lived on the handouts of others. Part of the package that people brought up to the mountain was a bottle of alcohol, a pair of pants, um, and a can of food, a can of some meat, sardines or a meat can. And that's what they brought to Harrison. They gave him a gift and then he told them charming stories, gave them a little water and sent them on their way. And again, if you look closely at these photos, you see how non-threatening he is. There are lots of women and children around him. He's always leaning on his stick. 
And, and, and this is something that we can be pulled into this narrative of, of just how disarming he was. But when you go deeper and when you start evaluating these sorts of stories, you realize that this performance that Harrison was putting on was incredibly commonplace across the country during the late 1800s and early 1900s. It's known as minstrelsy or the Minstrel Act, where African Americans would play the fool. And these were at their height during 1890 to 1920, the same exact time when white San Diego tourists were visiting Harrison on the mountain. Every city, every community had amateur minstrel groups. And contemporary white society thought this was authentic African-American culture. The acclaimed poet James Weldon Johnson noted that these minstrel shows fixed the tradition of the Negro as an irresponsible, happy-go-lucky, wide-grinning, loud-laughing, shuffling, singing, dancing sort of being. That was what Harrison presented to his audiences, his visitors to the site, and they lapped it up. He spoke in broken English. He did his aw shucks act. He, he made racial epithets about himself. And that was what white San Diego wanted to see. And that's what they saw. And they took a photo of it and they went on their way. And this is where it got so fascinating because it was the archeology span that undermined all of this. We started finding artifacts that didn't match with the usual portrait. We started finding distinct Native American goods that pointed to some sort of different life, a pendant, an iron cross. You can see the portable matate that's been snapped in half, likely commemorating his passing. And this is where, when we started seeing all these ties to the indigenous community, that when we went to the indigenous oral histories, we saw that there was another individual in the records, never been identified before. And this individual was Inez Harrison. And this is where it gets crazy because Inez, Inez Harrison was Nathan Harrison. When Nathan Harrison was baptized by his indigenous godparents, shown here on the screen, Chief Juan Sotelo Kalak uh, and his wife Encarnacion Kalak, when they baptized Harrison, he took the confirmation name Inez. And so we see Inez in the records. Inez Harrison was somebody who was part of Native American society. He participated in the dances. He spoke Luis Seno. He married different Native women at different times. And then we start evaluating how Harrison got this property. We were so fixated on the fact that he was the first homesteader. And we were scrutinizing this homestead certificate but we almost missed the fact that he was given the land by the Luisenia. So think about this for a second. He had justification. He had approval to own this land from all the different stakeholders in the region. That is almost unheard of in San Diego history. Many times colonial forces would have some sort of colonial authority to take the land, but the indigenous population didn't agree to it. And other times the indigenous people would have ownership of the land, but that wouldn't be recognized by colonial or missionary forces. Harrison was able to keep these alliances, jump through the hoops, satisfy the standards of different cultures. And then he places his cabin at this nexus where it's right next to the U.S. American road and it's right next to an old Luiseno trail. And this is where it gets fantastic because he was able to unite these different aspects of his life and yet keep this dual identity secret. When it comes to the artifacts, some of the things were isolated, you know, in, in terms of, of finding the crucifix, in terms of finding the pendant, in terms of finding unfired projectile points. And some of them weren't. Where we find hundreds of fired rifle cartridges at the site. And yet he's virtually never photographed with his firearm. It's never mentioned in stories that he owned a firearm. And according to California state law, it was illegal for anybody associated with the California Indians to purchase firearms or munitions, meaning that all of this was illegal. And it was illegal from 1854 to 1913, which is just about the entire occupation of the site. And what's fascinating is that 
most of these cartridges match and come from the same weapon. Most of them are a 22 and they're rim fired. Very distinctive. We were able, even able to pull a thumbprint off of one of them, which is a spectacular story for another occasion. So we have Harrison concealing the fact that he owns a rifle, that he is armed at the site. And suddenly we start seeing this consistent portrait of what he's hiding, this alliance with the Native American population, the fact that he's a Catholic, rampant discrimination against Catholics at the time. And then it gets really exciting because we start finding all of these different writing implements at the site. Now, all of the census records, except for the very last one in 1920 when he's hospitalized, emphasized that he was illiterate. And yet at the site, we have a pen cap, we have sharpened pencil leads, we have erasers, we have an ink bottle. This is what gets so fascinating, is on the one hand, every government record says he couldn't read or write. In fact, if you look closely in the bottom right here, that's his voting record voting record from 1894 and you see it looks like he signed it it says nathan harrison until if you look in that red circle it says his mark and has an x there think about how fascinating it is for somebody who has all these writing supplies at his cabin who decides to feign like he can't read and write on a voting record think about the power of voting same thing went for his uh, homestead certificate. Think about the fact that he fakes illiteracy while doing things like registering to vote, like claiming water and owning land. Some of the most empowering things in the Old West, some of the most empowering things in America, and yet he is faking illiteracy. And the reason this was so important um, and this, this goes back to the revolt of, of Nat Turner long before Harrison's in California, when it, when it was the American position that white America had to keep black America illiterate because knowledge was power. Literacy was seen as a threat to the social order and that was why African-Americans were kept apart from education and other tools of literacy. Now, what's interesting is if you go deep into African-American folklore, you see that one of the key figures is the trickster. That is something where very often in these old stories, African-Americans will celebrate characters who play the fool, but are actually very keen and savvy. And they are able to carefully choreograph some duplicity. They're tricksters. They outsmart stronger opponents. They outsmart uh, wealthier opponents. They outsmart well-armed opponents. And they do this by using tactics that are outside of norms. They have fake identities. They wear masks. They're experts in misdirection. One of my favorite Oscar Wilde quotes is that a mask tells us more than a face. This was Harrison's mask. He put on a show. His minstrel act was putting on a performance for his white audiences. And then he was a completely different person when he was hanging out with Mexican ranchers, with Catholics in the reason, with Louis Rose, a close friend of his and the first Jewish settler in the reason, and most importantly, with the Native American community. He had this line down the middle where he had one identity for one group and one identity for another. So let's turn our attention now to this past summer. So we head up to Palomar Mountain. We're all excited after losing a, a year of digging because of COVID. And we start back up at the site. And I remember thinking to myself, this is going to be one of those years where everything looks familiar. And again, I, I couldn't have been more wrong because one of the first finds that we found during that first week of excavation was a 19th century brass men's wedding band. And there it was in the midden, in the trash pit. So it goes cabin. And then to the west of the cabin is the patio, and the west of the patio is this very rich midden. This ring is absolutely breathtaking and intriguing, and it blew me away when we found it. Part of the reason it blew me away is it was mixed in with the garbage, mixed in with butchered cow bones, mixed in with a relish bottle from 1918, mixed in with the midden. 
And it was on its side too. It just seemed to be thrown there in the ground. So what's the big deal about the wedding ring? Well, the debate over whether or not Harrison had been married is one of the most contentious issues in the Nathan Harrison biography. In fact, even at his memorial up on Palomar Mountain in 1923, there was all sorts of whispering about whether or not he was married. So Ed Davis was the one who, who gave the eulogy. And, and the reason he, he, he gave the eulogy was so many people were choked up and couldn't go through with it. Uh, Theodore Bailey was, was one of the close friends who just was, was too choked up at the, the, the passing of his friend. And so Davis gets up there and at the memorial, which is well attended, he said that Nathan Harrison had many opportunities to get married but that nobody could tame his heart. And so he chose to walk his own way and never marry. As he's saying this, the murmurs go through the crowd, Robert Asher, Louis Salmons, and they start whispering to each other, hey, hey, wait a second, wasn't Harrison married? Wasn't he married? Yeah, yeah, he was married twice. No, he's married three times. And what's funny, if you read this passage here, is Robert Asher is writing in the first person, and he's about to say something to debunk the fact that Harrison was never married. And he says, Lewis Sammons was looking me full in the eyes with a peculiar expression on his face, which said as plain as can be, Bob, you keep your mouth shut. That's what the look on his face said. And then Robert Asher, referring to himself, says, you can just bet that Bob, meaning himself, did keep his mouth shut for the time being at any rate. And so what's fascinating is that this ring helps to answer that question. And it again shows this duality that he's, he's hiding his marriages to the Native American women, um, because that doesn't fit with the mountain man myth and the Ashok's act that he puts on for the visitors. But the, the finding of the ring was just the start. As many of you know, the research of an artifact is almost as exciting as the finding of the artifact itself. And so one of my grad students, J Jamie Bastidi, took it down to Enhancery Jewelers. And not only were they so kind to help us. They're also grads of San Diego State, and so they got really excited by this project, and they did a test on this ring. We didn't know what it was made of. Was it gold? Was it silver? And they performed an acid test and showed that it wasn't gold and it wasn't silver, and then they performed an x-ray analysis, and that's where the great results came through, that it was 92% copper and 6% zinc, and that means it was brass, and brass has this wonderful history as a gold substitute, as the poor man's gold. And this, this is perfect because we see so many things that are of the laboring class at the Harrison site, and yet at the same time have this gilded finish to them. I mean, it, it is the gilded age, um, you know, it is the late 19th century. And so this is perfect for the site. What is peculiar about the ring is how big it is. It's a size 10 and a half notably large by today's standards. But Kathleen White explained to us that because so few of us now are actually working hard with our hands, we're just typing away on our keyboards or poking away text messages on our phone, that the muscles on our fingers are not nearly as developed as they were in Harrison's time. So a size 10 and a half was actually a normal man's wedding ring size, much larger than our dainty figures of, dainty fig, fingers of today. So let's talk more about this marriage because another one of the big discoveries was on a genealogical front. One of the wonderful things about so many new records being scanned all the time is when it came to trying to determine the names of Harrison's wives, we only had that his first wife was Fred Smith's mother for the longest time. Fred Smith actually went by the nickname Fred Sheepsmith one of the biggest uh, sheep owners in all of Southern California. And all we knew was that Harrison was married to Fred Sheepsmith's mother. Uh, and where it got so exciting is there was a photograph found in the cabin long ago, long before we started digging. And on the back of this photograph to Harrison, it said from your granddaughter, Dory Mary Smith. Um, and that is Fred Smith's daughter. And so we'd been searching for Dory Mary Smith's grandmother, Nathan Harrison's first wife, Fred Smith's mother, all the same person. And that's where one of the students found a name for our individual. And this was Maria T. Osuna, who was a Pachanga Indian. 
And what got so fascinating about this is once you have a name, you're able to create the whole family tree. And we see that Maria had two children, Charles L. Smith and Fred Smith. And this is where it gets so neat because Fred Smith married Maria A. Mogort. Um, the Mogort family was fairly famous during this time. The Mogort sisters were. And it helped to explain one of these pictures that you've seen before. Look closely. Nathan Harrison is holding a bouquet of flowers. I've always been mesmerized by these photos because these don't look like your typical tourists. They're bringing him flowers. Now, they're not bringing him a bottle of alcohol, a pair of pants, and a can of sardines. They brought him flowers. And it's, it's because they were his relatives. The Mogart sisters were his daughter-in-law and all of her sisters. And so we see all of those, those great connections. It also gave us hope that we were going to find a, a living relative of his wife's family. Unfortunately, though, all of Dory Mary Smith, Karakabura's family, uh, Dory Mary Smith married Frank Karakabura, um, all of their children are deceased. The ring in cultural context, one of the great things that so many of you know from archaeology is you find something that answers one question, but then it raises 10 additional questions. So you're actually losing ground. We know Harrison was baptized Catholic. And we know that Catholic weddings include a blessing and exchange of rings. What's fascinating to investigate, though, is what happens to an item that's been blessed when it's no longer in use. Uh, in terms of Catholic tradition, you don't simply discard an item that's been blessed. You either burn it or bury it. And then this, this is what just gets so intriguing. So how did that ring get there? Did it just fall off his finger when he was taken out the trash? Was it accident, accidental deposition? What Did he take it off and hurl it in a fit of rage as his marriage fell apart? Or was it intentional blasphemy? Or is this actually evidence of the proper disposal of burning and burying uh, a blessed item that's no longer in use? And those are questions for us to continue to struggle with. Some of the other finds that popped up that were so exciting had to do with the site and also had to do with getting the message out about Harrison. And one of those had to do with Harrison's firearm. Now, one of the great friends of the project, Palmar historian Peter Bruggeman, he had had a meeting with the Douglas family in the city of Orange over a decade ago. And he remembered them telling a story that they allegedly had Harrison's rifle. And the story made sense because Leo Douglas, who was alive during the, the late 19th century, um, when he was a kid, he was an avid mountain, liner, mountain lion hunter and was a close friend of Harrison. So when Leo Douglas was a teenager, and Nathan Harrison was in his 60s and 70s, and they bonded. And Leo Douglas went to school on Palomar, and so he was, he was in Harrison's backyard. And then we see future stories that the Douglas offspring married into the Mendenhall family, uh, Mendenhall owned property right next to Harrison's. So, so there seemed to be some good provenance for consistency of this story. And the story was is that the, the weapon had been passed um, from Leo Douglas to his son, Herb Douglas, and then ultimately to the granddaughter, uh, Donna Douglas. So I sent out uh, letters, physical. First, I tried the internet and email and Facebook and all that stuff. Had absolutely no luck tracking this down. And then I sent postal letters to everybody named Douglas in Orange that I could find. And it was a very strange letter where I said, hi, I'm Seth Malias. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I just need to know if your family has a 19th century rifle in the closet that once uh, was owned by Nathan Harrison. And lo and behold, uh, last Thanksgiving, I was contacted uh, by Donna Douglas, and we were able to track down the rifle. And this is what gets so fascinating, because it's not a rifle. It's a double-barreled shotgun. And so it's, it's a good news, bad news thing. The bad news is it doesn't match up with the rim-fired rifle cartridges that we find all over the site, although we do find some shotgun shells. But the great news is, if you look really closely in the magnifying glass there, you see that this shotgun was produced by the National Arms Company. And the reason that that's so spectacular is they only had a six-year run. They were bought out by Colt. And so they have a very tight date range. And so this shotgun dates very specifically to Harrison and Harrison's time on Palomar Mountain. Um, the other neat thing 
is we found what's known as a powder flask charger at the site when we were digging last summer. Drawn in a little sketch from an old catalog on the right and then photographed in the middle, this matches up with the uh, powder flask that we found two years earlier. And that would be something that would be used to fill shotgun shells with powder. And this is very intriguing to start connecting the dots on all of this. So when we bring this all together, our old insights and our new insights, there's one thing that I need to address, and that is why would Harrison need to put on an act? There's clear evidence that he lived this double life and that he went to a lot of effort to make sure that people didn't know he was putting on an act. It had to be convincing. And the best way to answer this question is to talk about the individual shown on the screen here named John Ballard. John Ballard has almost the same biography as Nathan Harrison up to a single point. They were both born enslaved in Kentucky. They were both brought west by their owner to Northern California, worked in the mines. They both migrated down to Southern California once they had their freedom. John Ballard homesteaded land in, in Malibu, nearby Malibu, you know, just, just a, a county and a half away and was the first African-American homesteader in his region. This is where the story gets different though. John Ballard never put on an act for anybody. He never did an aw shucks routine. He was outspoken, uh, he was very political and he was armed and the locals burned him off the property. It's fascinating when you have a moment in archeology span where you have identical held variables and then one thing is different. John Ballard didn't put on a minstrel act. He didn't put on a show for people. He didn't have a double identity and the local white folks burned him off the property. He was very outspoken and he paid for that. And so when you think about Nathan Harrison, he's in the situation where not only does he need to put on an act, but it has to be successful because his survival is dependent on it. So in terms of new directions for the site, these are images that folks haven't seen before. This is all brand new. Uh, the first thing is we started backfilling the site. We're getting close to wrapping up this project. And you look in the bottom photo there, you can see the whole right side of the site is backfilled. Uh, the area currently under excavation is surrounded by those white sandbags. We're also repatriating the Native American artifacts to the local Luiseno. Uh, many of you know local NAGPRA law, know all about AB 275 that's now in effect and all the inventories that have to be on record by January 1st of this year. We are NAGPRA compliant. We've been working with the different Luiseno tribes and we're happy to send this site into its next phase. Now we will be digging on Saturdays in the spring and our goal is to establish that Western edge of the site. But just because we're wrapping up the digging doesn't mean this is ending. Uh, we're working tirelessly to develop an education program so that this can be part of the local curriculum and we're continuing to expand the exhibit programming that we have. Now, when we take the lessons of Harrison, when I say that I want this to be part of the curriculum, we need to go beyond Harrison the individual. This is where we need to go broader in terms of looking at societal issues. And this is where I think we can do a great job of myth busting. You know, I, I, I was raised in the California school system. I know all the myths that I was taught in California history as we were building our, our missions out of popsicle sticks. Um, and I know that the Harrison story helps to debunk some of the, the worst California myths that get perpetuated. Well, number one, that California was a free state. For tens of thousands of individuals, California was not a free state. Um, that's just inaccurate to proclaim that it was a free state. Myth number two, um, you know, is that is that is that California was pro-union during the Civil War. It, it wasn't. South Southern California was a hotbed of secessionism. People were parading in the streets in Los Angeles in favor of Confederate generals. California did play a role during the Civil War, but it wasn't a pro-union role at all. And I think the biggest one, this myth three here, is that we're taught that the late 19th century, the early 20th century was this time of harmony and racial equality in California, that somehow we project um, the you know, San Francisco summer of love back into the 19th century. And, and it's, it's just not true. With the number of sundown towns across uh, Southern California with how unsafe it was for ethnic minorities to, to spend the night in those towns, 
that, that they, they could face legal persecution for just spending the night in the town. And it helps to explain why there are memorials, large markers to the Confederacy in Mount Hope in our city cemetery, why a local elementary school until just a few years ago was named Robert E. Lee Elementary School. We need to accept the fact Southern, Al Southern California was settled by Southerners, that people migrating often followed those lines of latitude. Northern California was settled by Northerners, Southern California by Southerners, and it makes the Harrison story even more intriguing and that he is settling in an area uh, that suddenly you have people who were formerly enslaved and people who formerly held slaves living right next to each other. And so that's what we're trying to do in broadening this into a curriculum. For me, I, I love this story because you have so many different stories of Harrison. It forces you to just sit in them all. If at any point you find yourself too in love with your own perspective, Encountering a historical story like the Harrison story forces you to appreciate other perspectives. And that may be the most important thing for the 21st century is learning how and why other people think differently. And I, I call this the saturation process. It's that sequence of just immersing yourself in all the different interpretations. Was Nathan Harrison a pioneer? Was he a mountain man? Was he a fool? Was he a cultural liaison? Was he a freeloader? Was he a hermit? Was he a tour guide? Was he a myth maker? Was he a legend? The answer is yes. He was all of those. He was putting on an act. And yet at other times, he was living his true life. And, and that may be one of the most important lessons for us all to think about is that do disempowered individuals still need to put on an act to survive and get by in society? That's where this project is as relevant in 2021 as it was when we started in 2001, and as it was during Harrison's lifetime in 1920. Thank you for joining me this evening. I'm now happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Malios. My name is Dante Ferenga, and I'm the Development and Marketing Director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. I'll be moderating the Q&A portion of tonight's discussion. Just as a reminder, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom control panel, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. All right. Did you start with any specific questions going into this project? Yeah, I sure did. It's, it's funny. I had a, a really rigorous research design that makes me laugh now. Um, because, you know, my first set of questions were really tied to archaeological dimensions, of space, time, and form. I wanted to know if, if this was the space that where Harrison homesteaded. I wanted to know the spatial aspects of the cabin, um, if they reflected anything in terms of cultural traditions elsewhere. Um, I, was, I was very fixated on, on looking at spatial relationships between um, Harrison in the indigenous community and Harrison in the, in the Anglo-American mountain community. In terms of time, I wanted to know, were there pre-Harrison artifacts? Was there a pre-Harrison component to the site? Was there a post-Harrison component to the site? And most importantly, did these artifacts match up with what we knew in the historical records uh, for Harrison being there? And, and then in time, in terms of form, the form of the artifacts, getting at these issues of an African-American cultural tradition, and in terms of being a, a low status individual. Now, those are my questions about you know, the, the consumer index and in terms of the status of these items. So that was the first set, the very literal, you know, the very literal set of questions. And I wanted to make them really simply because remember, I had just come from Jamestown where our research design there was three words. Bill Kelso took such great pride that our research design was find the fort. You know, people have been looking for that fort for over 100 years and had never found it. And that's what he wanted to do. He didn't want to get lost in jargon. You know, remember his mentor was Noel Hume. And Noel Hume used to mock anthropologists. He said that anthropologists use jargon the way a South American general wears an epaulet, you know, those, those fancy decorations on their military uniform. Um, so he would mock us all the time. But then I also wanted to have a second level of deeper theoretical, um, broader questions in our research design. And those had to do with settlement patterns 
I was intrigued by the fact that most urban places are settled by ethnic minorities first, but San Diego is the opposite. The different ethnic minorities came to rural parts of San Diego before they came to urban parts. You know, they came to Julian, uh, they came to, to Palomar Mountain, they came to Escondido. And so I was intrigued by settlement patterns. Um, so that was one of our questions. And then I also wanted to get at these, these broader artifact patterns, uh, figuring out where does the Harrison site sit in comparison you know, to, to the Whaley House artifacts, um, to different old town settlements. Um, so I, I wanted to look at that. And then I also wanted to look and see if there was anything that jumped out in terms of ethnicity, ethnicity and identity. I have to be honest with you, in all my research design questions that we started out with, not a single one of them had anything to do with dual identities and minstrel acts. I had no idea where the site would take me. And that's where, like one of the most important things I can tell young archeologists when they're starting out, you need to have questions when you start, but be prepared to go on a wild ride. The site will take you where it wants to take you. And if you try and force questions on a site and just stick to those questions, it's, it's gonna be bumpy. And that's what, what blows me away about this, this project is if I had written the book on the Harrison project, when we took that break after the Pumacha fire in 2008, I hadn't figured out the dual identity yet. I would have missed probably the most important thing about the site. And that, that I find that so humbling that I might have missed the entire point of the site. I guess the only good thing is everyone else missed it before me, but still, that would just be devastating. It was only through this second decade of excavation that all the patterns started to come together. And that's where I, I think we need to have some flexibility with our research design once we're up and running. So that's a, a really long answer to a very short but good question. All right, where do we go to follow your archeological sites progress? Is it possible to actually visit the dig? So um, we have a, a great project website, um, nathanharrison.sdsu.edu. Um, and we're, we're on social media and I can't take credit for that, but my team is really good about uh, having stuff posted. I believe I'm at Seth Malios. I can be corrected on that because I really don't know what I'm talking about. Um, so, so we're active through those ways. And then we have this full scale exhibit right now. We must have a couple of thousand of exhibit space in the History Center and we'll be there through to th uh, 2023. Um, but this is where it gets even more exciting is you all can stay at this property. The Harrison property is private property. It is Harrison Serenity Ranch and it's an active bed and breakfast. Uh, Vicki Morgan is the landowner. She's been a great partner to the site from when she purchased it in, uh, I think it was 2008, 2009. Um, and so you can actually be a part of the experience of living on Palomar Mountain and you can actually see our, our excavation there. Um, so there are many ways to engage with the site um, up close and personal. It is private property, so you need to be permission to be there. But one way to get permission is by, is by staying there and spending the night. Uh, we, we try and be accessible in, in, in every way we can. Um, that's why we wrote all those articles for the Journal of San Diego History that's online and going through those avenues uh, like Archaeology Magazine. And, and we did live feeds from the dig uh, five days in a row. Uh, last summer, uh, which was pretty crazy navigating all that. But Mike Watson at Video Approach was, was pretty phenomenal in making that happen. Did you find any evidence of his marriages, presence of his wives at the cabins, aside from the ring? So, you know, in, in terms of the historical evidence, this is one of the most frustrating things is that so many of the records of weddings were burned. Um, through the, through the years, especially at Paula Mission, where he likely would have been married. So we didn't have evidence in the historical record. And in terms of looking at gender issues at the site, it became intriguing because there was a makeup, tin, uh, a tin of makeup that we found at the site. It gets even more fascinating in that the tin was of white makeup. I, I you know, when, when we think about the artifacts that we find, there's always a moment where you find something and you realize, I never expected that, that, that an African-American uh, in the Old West would have a, a tin of, of white makeup at his site. 
we find some evidence of kids' toys at the site, a marble, a small teacup, um, cardboard puzzle piece. Um, so there are things that hint at family, at kids, um, but we don't have anything specifically gendered as, as feminine at the site. I, I don't really like assigning gender to a single artifact. I like looking at the larger collection. Uh, but what we do see is that he engaged with a lot of people. Um, you know, that, that is what's clear to have, to have that many artifacts. And one of the things that, that I left out is, is we have over 200 buttons at this site. Uh, if we were digging this site and we didn't have all this historical information, we'd think a lot of people were living there to have that many buttons. Uh, but what we're seeing is this regular interaction with individuals. So the simple answer to your question is no, not too much evidence that points specifically to female inhabitation at the site. Any evidence of connections with other early African-American families? This is a, a great question because it seemed like Harrison would have to be spending time in Julian. Uh, for those of you who know so much about local history, you know the Robinson Hotel and Fred Coleman finding gold and starting the Southern California Gold Rush. All these individuals are African-Americans. There was a point in San Diego County where Julian had, I believe, a quarter of the African-Americans in all of San Diego County. And it's this, it's this you know, primary settlement of African-Americans in the region. And I kept on looking and looking and thinking there would have to be a Julian connection and I didn't see anything. And then David Lewis, another great friend of the project and Julian historian was going through the original records and he found a solitary record of Harrison in Julian. And it was an arrest for being drunk in public in 1888. And yet again, this is one of those things where you answer one question and then it suddenly begs 20 more questions. So what happened in 1888? You know, and what's fascinating is not only was he arrested, but then the judge waived the fine, uh, something that's, that's just intriguing. But the simple answer to your question is, no, we don't have a lot of links to Julian except for that one encounter. And perhaps things went very wrong in that encounter. Maybe he got thrown in jail and, and vowed never to go back. I don't know. It's a great question. There is, a, there is an additional side to it. And that is that when you read through a lot of the historical archaeology of the West, you often see that each of these towns either had major African-American settlements or a lone African-American in their community. And Harrison definitely seems to be part of that latter group where he was the one African-American in the community that had managed to get in good with all the individuals. Um, but it's an intriguing question, but we, beyond the drunken public record, we really don't have much of a tie um, to Julian. Was the broken matate possibly broken in honor of his death found in the same patio region as most of the other artifacts? So we found two matates that had been busted. One was to the right of the cabin. So one of them wasn't near the artifacts. It was actually on the other side of the structure. And then the other was in the patio area. And, and this gets so intriguing because the historical records you go deep enough emphasize that he had two native wives. So these could have been memorials to them or they could have been memorials to him. You know, we don't know if they were placed there after his passing. Um, and and this, this gets so intriguing trying to figure out the commemoration of Harrison um, in terms of the role that he played. Something that, that I didn't talk about, and, and this is, you know, the, the Harrison book has over 300 pages and we poured our hearts and souls into this. And a big part of the Harrison story is that he gets sick in 1919, is convinced to go to the hospital, comes down to the San Diego County Hospital, um, you know, right under today's TGI Friday at the corner of 163 and the eight. Um, he dies there in 1920 uh, and he's put in an unmarked grave in Mount Hope. He is not legendary when he's in the city of San Diego. He's not celebrated when he's in the city of San Diego. He's celebrated when he's a mountain man. He's celebrated when he's doing his minstrel act up on the mountain. He's forgotten about for a half century in Mount Hope before um, local scholars end up finding his grave and getting a, raising money to have a suitable gravestone that's put there. 
Uh, so in, in terms of this issue of commemoration, there's this split between commemoration that happens on the mountain with the local community and undoubtedly with the indigenous community and then what happens in San Diego where he's lost and forgotten. What Luceno artifacts did you find at the site? There are, there are about 50 total, um, some, some chip stone, um, some, some local pottery, some Tison brownware, um, and then the, the pendant, and then uh, a couple of unfired projectile points, projectile points that, that weren't busted, and they were buried in the corners of the cabin, which clearly had um, some symbolic meaning there. Um, the site is near um, different grinding stations, um, but the, the stuff that we see at the site doesn't, doesn't suggest a heavy native occupation right at the site. Um, and so that's where, um, you know, it's, it's tricky to figure out because one of the previous landowners did have a bulldozer and did push things back and forth in and around the site. Um, but there still is a lot of continuity in the area. Um, so, you know, to have about 50 Luisenio artifacts out of 55,000 uh, artifacts is, is a pretty small percentage. At the same time, we were happy to go through the, the NAGPRA consultation process. And the, and the different tribes have been fantastic, both in terms of uh, collaboration and, and also in terms of their input into this project. What's your synops synopsis of the faunal data? And what do you know about Nathan Harrison as a horse trader? That's a great question. So one of the fascinating things about Harrison is that certain activities that were listed in the census records and were listed in the stories tied directly to the fauna that we find. To that we find. So he's, he's well known as someone who is in charge of the sheep. And that's the number one set of fauna remains that we find. We find sheep shears at the site, three different pairs of sheep shears. Um, and we find that just about all the sheep at the site that were butchered were butchered, I believe it's after six years, after they were no longer producing wool for the site. So not only does it appear that he's taking care of the sheep, but that he's only butchering them once they're no longer producing wool. And when we go through the photos, we see that it sure looks like he is um, stretching some of the hides. I don't think he was tanning the hides. We haven't found any chemical signature of tanning hides uh, or any of the tools associated with that, but we think that there's some taxidermy going on. We think that he's preparing um, some of those skins um, uh, up, up at the site. So there's that. At the same time, we see some butchered cow bone, um, some butchered pig. Uh, we see some, some wild deer at the site. And so we have this real mix. And when you think about the different periods at the site, dominated by cattle initially, and then sheep, and then pig, uh, it's, it's, it's fun to see all these things represented. I, I wish we had some evidence of beekeeping as well, because that was all the rage at Palomar Mountain in, in the early 1900s as, as well. Um, I saw the additional part of that question was about horses and horse trading. This is absolutely intriguing because we find hundreds of things related to horses, horseshoes, horseshoe nails, tacks, all sorts of saddle buckles, um, different ornaments that have to do with the bit, that have to do with the saddle, all the different things in terms of care for horses. And, and there's so many great stories that tie Harrison to horses, the most important of which was when, when I told you about how Harrison lost his property in 1911 because he wasn't paying property taxes and the county auctioned it off. He was very distraught because somebody picked it up at auction and said, this is my property now, get out. And the, the locals were outraged at this. They were not let this guy named Hargrave was gonna steal Harrison's property. They weren't gonna let Hargrave get away with it. And so the entire community rallies to him. I mean, they're, they're calling in, you know, Congressman Kettner, a million dollar Kettner. They're calling in every favor they have so that Nathan Harrison can hold on to his cabin. And they make it clear to this Hargrave individual, you will not be living here. And the compromise they strike is that Harrison would give him one of his horses in exchange for getting his cabin back. And this is where it's clear, and the records state this, the historical records clearly state this, that horses were Harrison's prime vendable commodity. Now think about this for a second. So much of what's going on at this site is gift exchange. 
People come up the mountain with presents for him and Harrison gives them water. Remember, he claimed the water. He could have sold it to them. He could have charged them for it. But as part of the Minstrel Act and as part of knowing that gift exchange builds community, he gives water and you give gifts and you get gifts and that bespeaks relationship. He's not getting into an adversarial commodity relationship except when it comes to his supreme good of value and that is horses. And that's what's so fun is to see this, the, the higher role that, that horses play in his life. And then there's this great anecdote that after Harrison's life, that packs of wild horses still congregated at his cabin, that they still roamed the mountain and still came to his site. Um, and, and, and that's something that, that really seems to, to be prominent in his life. So we can't underestimate the importance of the different fauna through the years and how horses were qualitatively different um, because of their value. All right. Did you reach out to the Mendelssohn family on Palomar Mountain about any knowledge of Douglas and Nathan Harrison? We've reached out to a, a bunch of the different families, and, and it's funny because some of them have been great. Um, the the Mendenhalls were so excited, they said, hey, maybe you should dig our property. And then there were crazy connections too. A, a gentleman that I had known for years at San Diego State informed me that he was Louis Shannon's grandson, uh, Louis, Louis Salmon, who was key to the Harrison story, one of Harrison's best friends. Um, so there's been all sorts of great things that have pulled together this community that is still a, a tight knit community. Um, and that's where, he, you know, even Kim Smiley, Kim and John Smiley, who lived the property just north of the Harrison property, have this, Kim has this great recollection of growing up as a kid on this property. Um, she tells us these great stories of, you know, when a horse was buried at the property in the 19, I think it was the 1940s. Um, and imagine how excited we would have been about finding a horse on the property and how devastated we would have been to seeing it happen after the, the Harrison occupation there. Um, so that's a, that's a key part of it too. In, in terms of the, the future directions of the site, I'd love to see oral histories with a lot of the families on the mountain. I'd love to see oral histories with the Luiseno community as well, because there are a lot of individuals there who have special insights um, into the, the Harrison story. And, and this is where we start, we get to start crafting this bigger, this bigger appreciation of the social network and of the community that's there. Um, I don't want anyone to think this is, that this project, that, that 20, my, 20 years of my life is just about one individual. It's about these much bigger issues like community, um, like identity and like survival. We had a comment actually relating to that about how your revelation of Mr. Harrison's double life reminded them of the archeological evidence in Monticello, what the enslaved persons on the property were subjected to and how they resisted in their own private lives. And what you said about archeology span being the last line of defense rang true, especially in today's age. Yeah, it's, so I, I went to graduate school in the University of Virginia and I actually lived on Browns Mountain, which is, overlooks Monticello. And, and my roommate and dear friend Derek still works at, at Monticello. And so a lot of the absolutely stunning work that they did in Monticello through the years, digging the slave quarters on, on Mulberry Row, um, had a huge impact on a whole generation of us um, studying archaeology. Uh, and, you know, I, I got my start at Flower 200 uh, back in the early 90s. Um, and Flyer 200 was where the first enslaved Africans were brought in the New World in 1619. Um, and so all of those things definitely impacted me. You know, it's, 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 it's so easy to, you know, get credit for supposedly coming up with new, different, innovative ideas. But, but we're all a product to all these experiences through the years. And I'm so indebted to the people that taught me archaeology and, and the places where, where I got to dig, um, you know, whether it was Monticello or Venable Lane in Charlottesville or all the different sites in, in Williamsburg and Jamestown. And that's something that, that is so fun to be able to have the next generation of archaeologists um, who join us for the field schools is they get to add this to their, their set of experiences and looking at the archaeological past. 
All right, I think we have time for one or two more questions. So if anyone has any last questions, please drop, drop them in the Q&A. And have you already started talking with schools about getting this into the curriculum? So I have a, a wonderful grad student named Chaley Gibbs, and this is her thesis topic. And we've met with different schools and we're starting to appreciate how different the, the world is between private schools and public schools, the difference between you know, elementary schools and middle schools and high schools. Um, and, and we are we wanna be sponges on this. We, we wanna learn the ropes from people on how you get, where teachers have flexibility and where they don't. Um, it's something that I, I don't know a lot about this, um, but I know that I fell in love with archeology span when I was five. And that's where I want to give people this opportunity for whenever they get excited about history and also how archaeology can turn it on its head. Um, so, so if anybody out there is a teacher, we would we would love your help in figuring out what hoops to jump through, you know, what's realistic, um, and and how and how we're started, start of something that has some longevity. One thing that, that I've been a part of, and this is a cautionary tale, is that it seems everybody's excited about the archeology span when the digging's going on. But I know far too many sites that once the digging stopped, that was no longer part of the local history and discussion. Um, Noel Hume's work at Martin's 100, I remember when they buried his museum and closed down Wollstone hometown. It was devastating for him and devastating for all of us who had been a part of that. I know, you know, the work that Ron May and so many of his colleagues did at Fort Guajaros and all the excitement there was at the time. And yet it's really tough to see a lot of Fort Guajaros, you know, unless you're going to the Ark Center, <laughs> unless you're, you know, willing to make the trek. And, and even with the Presidio, so many people had such a wonderful experience at the Presidio, but it's so tough to access those materials. So that's, that's where I feel that, that, that we need to take on this challenge. How, how do we make it so that the, the Harrison archeology, span the Harrison artifacts, the Harrison lessons are still as exciting and as engaging to people when our exhibit isn't at the History Center, when the artifacts aren't so easy to see? Uh, I think that's something that we need to try and take on. Well, we're getting a few more comments uh, thanking you for tonight's presentation and thank you for your work. So I just like to say again, thank you, Dr. Malios for tonight's talk. And thank you to everyone for attending tonight's living room lecture. If anyone would like more information on our upcoming events or visiting the museum, please visit our website at sandiegoarchaeology.org. Thank you and have a good night. Take care, everybody.